Fire and Forte and a very warm welcome to Nikki Price. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you. And I think it's just so funny that I had no idea really where you lived. And I feel as though you're down the road now, now that we've just established. Actually, we're both in Sydney right now. So, um, you know, go for a coffee and see each other in real life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce you to the audience because Nikki Price is a publicist and media founder with her own business, priceless media I'll I'll start by asking you what the 40s have meant for you which you know no one does look in their 40s these days but you really don't do you <laughs> uh, a lot of people tell me that I, I mean like it's hard for yourself to know really it's like you know you look you 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 know your age and you feel look how you think you should look at that age but <laughs> so it's, it's hard it's hard, hard for me to know I have people tell me I don't look 40 but so I'll, I'll take it but <laughs> yeah but um I turned 40 in December, so it's been, uh, I'm only five months into it, but um, the way I put it was I made a post on my Instagram when I turned 40 saying that um, it's hit me in a different way than I thought it would have in that I am very proud of where I've been and where I'm at at the moment and that my 30s were crazy but I'm so grateful for the craziness because it led me to where I am now. So, but I also think, um, you know, when I turned 40, it was almost like a big party. It was, and it was a big party as well. <laughs> but, um, but I felt like I celebrated for about a month. And then once that um, that celebration part was over, it's like, oh, okay, wow. Um, so this is it. I am 40. This is, I've really got to look at where I am in my life and whether I am really happy with it, where I'm, if I'm happy with where it's going um, and what changes do I need to make to be completely myself, me, my authentic self, because I think that's very important. And that's what was most important to me was that if I'm now at this age where, and I know you'll probably completely understand, I know every other woman who's turned 40 as well, you get to this point, you just don't give a crap what anybody else thinks anymore because it's all, like it's, it, you've gone through that. You've gone through that in your 20s where you, care so much about what others think and then your 30s are part of undoing that and then by, by your 40s I think you have gone to a place of calmness in who you are and but I think you need it then you get hit with this confidence as well that you get to be this person finally. It's really promising, isn't it? I love hearing from women that are role models to others to say, don't fear it. You know, if you're 39 and a half right now, don't fear it. There's a calmness and a confidence that comes with it. You referenced a craziness in your 30s, uh, in your 20s, this being a time of maybe caring more what others think. What kind of led you to this moment in for at 40 that led to calmness and confidence? And what was going on for you in those 20s and 30s? Um. Yeah, well, I think um, I did suffer a lot um, through uh, my earlier part. Of, isn't it crazy we say earlier part of our life and we really don't feel that old? <laughs> my the early... Q what? The first quarter of my life. I know, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I suffered a lot with um, low self-esteem and um, bad self-confidence. And when I look back now, I realise that a lot of the decision I, I made were based on that about the way I felt about myself and so there was a lot of doing things because I felt like that's what society expected of me or that's what people would like more from me um, and I think if we think like that we're always going to end up at a place in our lives which is filled with anxiety and depression basically because you're not you're not being yourself and um, that's always going to be a hard pill to swallow is that maybe all these bad feelings you're feeling are because of the way you've been treating yourself and the way you think about yourself so yeah um so I made some decisions that I'm not overly proud of but again I don't regret them because they led me to where I am um my 30s were um I mean, I had but I had my first child when I was twenty nine, and I was married. Married, um, had my second child when I was thirty three. Um, the marriage started falling apart by the time I was thirty four, um, and then 
I think when you invest so much of your life in being a mum and being a wife and when that starts to fall apart, you really question who you are and where you want to go. Um, so, yeah, at that point, I think that was also when I started to make the decision that I wanted to really um, take the leap and I started I'd been writing my own film reviews for a while because I did study film at university and um, they ended up leading me to take a few trips to the United States and um, being there at Oscar time and being able to um, go and do some really cool things and be around some really cool people. And so that was exciting. But at the same time, my marriage was falling apart at home and I felt like my life was falling apart back in Sydney. So it was kind of like these two different lives that I was living at once. And so then once I started working in publicity in the United States, I was really hoping that I could make a life where I'm going back and forth between the States and here. But of course, then the pandemic hit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so that just threw all the plans out the window and but um yes yeah, so but I, I really feel like tw- my 20s and 30s were stuck in a place of wanting to be the best version of myself but not knowing how to do it so I think towards the end of my 30s I really started to realize okay well if I want to feel better about myself and I want to do the things that I want to do with confidence and I need to make changes in my life. It's a really fascinating story because I think lots of people can uh, uh, empathise and appreciate that. The world doesn't really make it a particularly easy place to be confident as a woman or a girl, does it? Yep. What kind of Did you personalise those at all or did you realise that other women might, like your friends might be feeling the same way? Um, I don't think. A lot of the time you do because when you have those issues, you spend a lot of time comparing yourself to everybody else. So you don't realise that other people are going through the same thing as you. Um, Because I find it also like sometimes when you have self-esteem issues, it is very egotistical as well. Like, and I found that that's what it was for me. It's like it's been in your ego a lot. You're like you're so worried about what other people are thinking about you constantly, which is exhausting (laughs) um so it's yeah it's really interesting like and it's a really great point that you make is that we don't think that other people are really going through that because we're so worried about what other people are thinking about us so you don't really you're not thinking that much about them you really just think about yourself because you're worried about what they think about you so it's it's a really weird circle to be in the benefit of hindsight isn't it as well I'm wondering if when you've worked out around ego etc if that's come with some kind of doing the work to or has that come yeah have you proactively done the work some therapy or anything yeah yeah well um I've gone to counseling psychologists over the years um the big um turn I made was when I started to raise self um improvement books and realized that if I want to feel better about myself and being in a better place of mind I've got to keep doing this work actively and then um I was very blessed to have somebody come into into my life who is a life coach who's Erica Kramer who is now um she's still pretty much my life coach but she's also one of my clients (laughs) so so and she's also very so she thinks you're pretty great as well there you go well being being around her is just it's um it's just uplifting and it's and it fills you with confidence because she's she's her name is the queen of confidence basically so it's so good having that energy but um yeah I entered into her year-long program this was before we were really friends or um I worked with her and um it, yeah it was a year-long program of, called the sisterhood of she gives you um books to read and, and things like that and the um and it was based and it's basically from Eckhart Tolle's book um that he he looks at the ego that way and it made so much so much sense to me is that so much of the time when we're worried about self-confidence we're just it's just we're just worried about our ego and nobody likes talking about the ego because it sounds scary and it sounds like you're saying oh you're completely up yourself you're so egotistical but it's it's a completely different way of looking at it I thought so yeah I really did dug in and did the work on myself and I think that's made the world of difference and that's what I'd recommend to anybody is that if you want to change it does require work it um it's not easy and a lot of people don't want to do it because there's scary stuff hidden within our soul that we don't want to approach but um 
yeah, I think it's well and truly worth it if you want to be the best version of yourself and get out of yourself who you really are and do the things you want to do. It's very encouraging to hear. Like you say, you can avoid it for a long time. I, I think lockdown made some people go one way and some some the other way, where you, it was a good opportunity potentially to work on yourself. Um, but then other times that could be a moment where you can't stimulate yourself with everything in the external world that would normally distract you from what any issues that you might have. So I think that that's also been a, a big resurgence of maybe self-help. And a lot of people seem to be quite self-aware now, which sounds freeing. Sounds yeah. to me like you've you've put some decent time into it, but it's been incredibly freeing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've put the time and the hard work into it and look, I've, I feel like even along the way there's been relationships that have like or friendships that have broken down because of it because you realize what's good in your life and what isn't um and yeah it's um it's hard work I reckon but um very rewarding at the end of the day very encouraging to hear and I've, I know I've got a couple of Eckhart Tolle's books and I'm thinking I might have to dig those out yeah I'm just, <laughs> I'm just wondering um if from a marriage point of view as well when you look back on that it seems quite young but only because when we're in our 40s we kind of go oh gosh I thought I was so grown up then yeah. was there anything if this was before you'd actually done the work was there anything where society had told you a marriage would feel good or you thought that maybe going into parenthood obviously that's like well that's what we're kind of here to do were there any assumptions around family life that you thought might sort of help your growth or um I think so. Um, I think uh, it's really hard to put into words. I think um, I think the right marriage can always help your growth. Um, being with the right person who, um, and not just marriage. I think being in any long term relationship with somebody, um, you want to grow with them. Um, you, and I think that's something which. Is really important that they support your growth and you support their growth and when um that isn't there that's when breakdowns can happen um i think um but the way i think i think i did grow up with the disney frame of mind in that you know the happily ever after which i think so many of us <laughs> got into their head is that you know you get you get the marriage proposal you get the marriage and then everything's going to be okay and um often things just aren't going to be okay and I, again, with the right person, I believe it can be. But if you're not with the right person, it's then there's no happy ever after, really. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I definitely went into marriage thinking it was almost like a reward. A bit like um, thinking that, oh, we've been together this amount of time. I deserve, I deserve a happy, I deserve a happy, happily ever after. And um, this is what society tells us as women that we're going to find it and it's not always the way <laughs> I mean it can be but for me it wasn't <laughs> I think you're surrounded by by this by everyone else being on the same track at a certain age aren't you you know as, mm -hmm. as a woman you start there's there's a whoop in the office as someone gets engaged someone's planning their wedding someone else is talking about moving in with each other so I think you get the society and the pull with everyone that you're around don't you and you just end up on that journey so I can really appreciate the reward of it as well because then you think we'll be settled this will all be good then yes exactly yeah you get this feeling that oh it's going to be okay now like I mean um I don't have to worry about any anything which is so immature way of thinking really but um at the end of the day I don't regret it at all because I got two beautiful children out of it and um, it did make me the person I am. So I don't regret doing it at all. I, I think we're all meant to be where we're meant to be, aren't we? And to Absolutely. get there, you, yeah. you, you, you've you got the scars to kind of make, yeah. help get you where you are today. Oh, look, I don't think anybody gets to 40 without having any scars. I think we've all got our issues <laughs> at 40. <laughs> and it makes you a stronger person, but potentially a kind of person because if life had been easy you might not see other people's pain that's right think? yeah for sure yeah yeah I'm, I'm an optimist can you tell I love it it's fantastic <laughs> <laughs> so am I <laughs> 
Now you you turned a, you, a, a an interest and a skill of film uh, right movie writing movie reviewing into I, I want to know how you actually went from writing movie reviews to ending up at the Oscars because that just seems a bit too much of a straightforward move. How <laughs> how on earth did that happen? And also, how did you find that passion for writing movie reviews? Um. Well, I think for for me, I think I've always been a big fan of movies. I was when I was a little girl. Um, for many, it's an escape, but I do really appreciate what goes into making the movie. I look for meanings in film. I It's just always been a passion, passion of mine, something that I love. And um, when I love something, I really love something. Like there's no gray area is either don't like or love um so I think um I really found my passion again as an adult for film was when I did go through a dark stage in my 20s and one of the things that pulled me out of it was and this is going to show our age isn't it going to blockbuster <laughs> and, and um heart and just um taking out about 10 movies at once and then devouring them over a few days and um I got to the point where I was going to the movies so much that I thought, well, everybody always said you should be a film reviewer, which, and it's funny because a lot of people say that to people who see a lot of films, but um, I, I've always loved writing as well. That's always been something that I've been quite good at. Um, so I put together my website, which I called Movie Critical, and um, basically every film I saw I put on, put a review on the site. So it was very time consuming, but I did love it. It was um, it was something that I wanted to grow into my career, but um, film reviewing does not pay very much, unfortunately. Um, so I did it for as long as I could. And then um, you find with, once you get to a certain stage of reviewing films, a lot of publicists start to reach out to you and say, can you review this film that we're working on? So um, that's, basically where it turned for me was um I um developed a friendship with um Michelle in the USA who um had her own business and then when I decided after I turned 30 that I wanted to go to the USA around Oscars time just as my 30th birthday present basically to myself and um so I went and met up with Michelle Michelle um took me under her wing into the um Hollywood circuit basically and um then yeah, so I got to be on, um, be near the Hollywood red carpet for the Oscars and got to go to quite a few of the after parties and things like that, which was crazy. Um, like it's it's such a contrast to being here. I was the um, the housewife who looked who had children, and then I went over there and I was hanging out at Hollywood parties. Um, so, but it's I have always been the type of person where if I set my mind on something, I would find a way to do it and so I wanted to work in the USA and that's just how it happened so because after a while Michelle said look I think you'd actually be really good um, as a publicist rather than just writing because you can use your writing skills to write press releases as well and um, I said well, well I'll give it a go and it's and it stuck basically so yeah I mean, obviously, I want to know if there's any juice from any of the parties. Who was the? Who are some of the celebrities that you came across? Oh, there's quite a few. <laughs> I, I was very lucky to be around um, a lot of them, but obviously, I can't say too say too much. I can't give away their um, their secrets or anything like that. But no, they're always so much fun. Um, a bit daunting to begin with, but um, once I found my feet, that yeah, they're a lot of fun. Amazing. Maybe what I'll do instead is try and work out the year that you were there and have a look at some, uh, you know, pap, pap <laughs> images and see if I can see you in the background of any iconic Oscar dress moments, etc. <laughs> Isn't it incredible how that worked out then that you, through your true passion for film writing and reviewing, it got mm. you to Hollywood and then that is how you became a publicist. What was your first client and your first publicity job and was that quite daunting because you'd gone from writing to actually a job that needs quite a lot of uh probably a lot more external kind of pushing doesn't it it's an element mm. of sales you could argue yeah um it was interesting I think I made the um 
the shift quite easily. But I think it's also because I had been around those people and in that world before I actually started it. Um, I think, yes, for quite a while, I whenever I was, because I was doing so much of the work from here, doing so much of the work from Australia, I didn't get to do as much of the hand up, hands-on groundwork as I would have liked to. Um, there were certainly parts where I got to go over there and work at the parties and um, do film premieres and things like that. But um, that was one of the things that I would have loved to have done more over there was more of the groundwork. Um, but it, it was a bit of a strange shift going from being one of the film reviewers to pitching out to the film reviewers and um, and then seeing both sides of it as well. Um, but I've been very lucky. I mean, I've still got my a one wonderful group of friends who are film reviewers and they're all still my best friends. So it wasn't like I became an outsider at all. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was good. But, um, yeah, I, I think that's, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to open up my own thing here because I realised I really do like working one-on-one -on -one with people and that was a big thing I was missing was actually going to work and being around people. Um, so I could do that in the States and I think that's one of the reasons I loved going over there was because it did feel like I was going over and doing my job and things were happening that way while here it was very much um, waking up at the crack of dawn to be able to be on the same schedule as America to be able to do work then and that started to get a bit hard after a while and especially with a family so yeah. you've you're you're the founder of priceless media I, I would love to know what what your average week entails oh wow um at the moment it's very very busy <laughs> which is fantastic I'm like I'm really happy and I'm extremely fulfilled with it um I don't think there's such a thing as an average week. Um, it depends if we've got an event going on or whether um, I have to be somewhere for my clients. There's a lot of phone calls, a lot of meetings, um, which is great because I do this. As I said, that's one of the things I do love about doing work here is I get to go out and see my clients and meet with people and network. And I do love the event side of it. Um, I feel like I do really strive with that. And another part of my job that I feel like I strive with is the relationship building. And it's so much easier to build relationships when you're standing there with the person rather than over a phone call or over an email. Um, so, yeah, it, I don't think there's such a thing as an average week. Um, they're all very busy weeks. <laughs> but, um, but each week is different. And it's um, a lot of people talk about if you... Um, Working a job that you love Mondays will never be that bad. Mondays aren't that bad. I do That's like Mondays. That's <laughs> incredible. You do like Mondays. I do. Well, it means I get I get to go and, like, I'm very blessed in that I do really adore all my clients. So it means on Mondays I get to talk to them again, which is great. <laughs> it's brilliant I think everyone can aspire to that because it means that you've found what you're truly good at and what the world needs as well what are the things that are there anything that's daunting about having your own business because I don't know have you got any have you got a team or do you do everything you're on your own I'm a one um one woman show at the moment <laughs> but um no it's so daunting it, it is daunting um I'm not gonna lie um, and I understand that's the reason why a lot of people wouldn't do it is because it's terrifying at times, especially when um, I, like, I started the business last year while I was still doing the USA stuff. So I had the two of them going at once, but it did get to a point in January where I realized that, again, this was one of the things that happened when I turned 40, was that um, I realized that if I really wanted to reach my true potential and do the things that I want to for my clients, they need 100% of me and I need to give 100% of myself to the business rather than try to split myself up and do two jobs at once. So it was really terrifying taking that leap um, to be able and to know that if this doesn't work out, that I haven't got the backup plan at the moment. Um, but yeah, it's been a massive risk. And there's, I'm not going to lie, there's been a lot of nights where I've laid awake in bed going, what am I doing? <laughs> like, what have I done? Like, why am I, why am I doing this to myself? But I have, like, now that it's been four months since I took the leap and just now I've got doing this, it's it's been going better than I ever thought it would. 
And so I think that's um, that's something which I think we all need to realise. Sometimes things just have, if you really want to work on it, things just have a way of working out. And especially if I think as well, like when you're 40, you have, you know, your you know, your gut instinct, you know, your intuition, you know, if there's, this is the right thing to be doing or not. And I had the massive feeling of, I've got to do this. This is the right thing to do. And even though I've been, I've played away wondering if I am, I still know it's the right thing to do. And you know those sayings about the regrets of people on their deathbed. You want to know that you've got no regrets and you could mm. easily have avoided that thought just to think, I've got a mortgage, I've got all of these yeah. responsibilities mm. because it was terrifying. So actually to respond to it takes so much guts. It really does. It's a massive risk. And um, yeah, that's one That's one of the things. Like when I turned 40, um, I've had big conversations and taken big risks, like and like, They've all been pretty much related to sort of the same thing, but it's, yeah, when you know the the way you want your life to go and you have to realise, okay, which parts of my life am I not being true to myself and what do I have to do to fix it? And that really, was it. <laughs> yeah, really wise words. There's a lot to take away from this, which is because now you're so set up for success for the next decade and beyond, aren't you? You've got everything probably. Well, we've talked about actually spiritually um, to some extent with your personal development. Uh, and then obviously from a professional point of view, but I'm wondering about the physical side of, of this as well, if that actually you're so all over it in all of these areas. What what are you doing physically? Does that does that tie in? Um. Well, I was yeah probably the last three years I've really got into um. Well, I think when COVID hit, I think a lot of people said, okay, we're either going to come out of this looking buff or we're going to be <laughs> or we're going to be like overweight. And when COVID hit, I. Um, like I wasn't overweight, but I had a few kilos on me, which I needed, not needed to get rid of. But I realized that if COVID came, I need to be healthy. And I think we've all had COVID now. Well, most of us are okay. But um, I decided then, and after this was, after the marriage broke down and I needed to get out of the house, I needed to go and do something. And one thing I've always wanted to do was boxing or kickboxing. But I went towards boxing and I did it because I know it would be a great emotional and mental release as well. So I started doing that and um, it's became a massive part of my life. And it's also um, part of my business too. Like quite a few of my clients are in the boxing world. And um, so that's a major part of my life now. Um, and also then in August last year, um, another risk that I decided to take was I decided to go to my first pole dancing class. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um and that I was more doing that for a laugh but I got there and again I'm the type of person that puts when I put my mind to something I've got to go all in with it and I thought well I'm crap at this today so I've got to get better so I've just kept doing it <laughs> amazing so how often are you doing pole dancing and how often are you doing boxing I go to boxing three times a week and pole dancing one <laughs> wow uh, I mean it's a lot of core work isn't it pole dancing and the cardio in mm. boxing is incredible can you tell me when you're boxing how do you get into a ring and how long do you do it for because it's exhausting it is exhausting it's um it's one of the best cardio works that workouts you'll have um I d I don't get into the ring um people have said to me why don't you do it I said no <laughs> I've got um one of my clients, Kate McLaren, she recently became the um, Australasian World Weight Champion. And um, the day after, um, she fought Katie Lodge, who was also one of my friends as well. So it was very confusing for me. <laughs> and, um, but the morning after I went, I saw Kate McLaren. She had a massive black eye that was taken over pretty much all of her face. And I was wondering, that's the reason I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> especially and, when people are watching you around the ring as well yeah I know yeah but um I'm also it's funny like I like I am a very confident person but I still don't want to hurt anybody so I still feel terrible sometimes when I nearly hit somebody when I'm doing pad work with somebody so I just I don't know if I have that part of me that would feel okay with hitting somebody in the ring um but um yet the cardio workout that I do I either do um, classes with um, a whole group of other people which is about an hour 
or I do personal training, which is about half an hour to 45 minutes. And how do you feel afterwards? Oh, so good. <laughs> I mean, the worst part of it is actually getting there. Like so many, and I know so many people who go to the gym feel this way is when you're walking up there, you go, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? What am I doing to myself? I hate myself. <laughs> but then um, when you come away from it, it's such a good feeling. And um, you, it, as I said, it does so much for you emotionally and mentally. So many people get into boxing for that reason. So, it does seem to be quite addictive. So, it, mm. and actually, now, um, and now I come to think about it, I remember someone saying it is a form of meditation in the sense that they were so focused on it that then they really didn't think about anything for that time that they were, had the pads. Is that something that resonates with you? I think so. Someone, uh, somebody did say to me, I get crazy eyes when I'm. <laughs> I think you kind of do, but like, and also because it's so much. Um, there's so many combinations. So you're boxing as well as you're thinking about what you're doing. So you do go into kind of a trance, like just thinking about the combinations of what you have to do ahead of it and behind behind it. So yeah, it's um yeah, that's a good way of putting it actually. Yeah, I never thought of it like that, but that's very true. Yeah. Well, because I, I was thinking, I wonder if meditation or journaling is part of your rituals, if you like. I mean, I don't know if you'd need it if uh, you're you're doing boxing, but oh, do you partake in any of those? I, do, I journal each day. I think that, and that's a very important part of my day. Um, I journal every morning and I also, every morning I write 10 things that I'm grateful for each day too. Um, I do journal sometimes at night as well, especially if there's a lot of my brain before I go to bed because it's just like getting everything out of your mind, putting it on a piece of paper and then you can, you don't have to deal with it. But after that, basically, you just go to sleep. But um, yeah, I think it's... um. I think journaling is really important. Um, meditation, I've tried, but I'm really not very good at it. Um, I know people say that it's not something that, you know, you should be talented at or anything, but, and I've told myself I need to work more at that part. But um, at this point in time, I think, yeah, the journaling and gratitude is really what works for me each day. That sounds a really good ritual, actually, as well. The routine of every morning, you're just probably in such a rhythm now of doing it that you don't even think about it. So you've almost carved that day, that time in your routine to make sure that you give that that some time. Yeah, well, it um it feels wrong if I don't. And um, like even when I'm traveling or something like that and I miss out on doing that first thing in the morning because I'm rushing to be somewhere, I will notice that that part of my routine is just not there and um but it does I think it people talk about how I'm a positive person and that's one of the reasons I am is because I do practice gratitude each morning and I think if you do that it puts you in a good place for the rest of the day because it's it starts you off on a good note like there'll always be something I mean like you know last week I um I started off doing that and then my son came down with a cold straight after and that made me made me upset but like and then I think, how upset would I be if I didn't do that beforehand? So it's, I think it's an important thing to do to be able to start everything off on a good good note. Yeah, brilliant. I, I think you said there were 10 things to be grateful for. It seems like quite a lot to think of, though. It really, it it, it is. But like, I think once you, it's, but it's all, it is like journaling as well. Uh, because like with journaling, you're supposed to just let your thoughts just flow and not actually really think about it's just whatever's on your brain you put it onto the piece of paper and so I, I do the gratitude right after that and I think it does make it easy because you're like um you don't really stop to think about it and it could be anything really like it, like I, I often put down I'm, I'm grateful for um how I'm self-aware and can know something's wrong or something like that so I think after doing the journal it doesn't it's not as hard as what it seems because you kind of already realise things about yourself when you've just journaled. Yeah, lovely. And actually that's a good point towards self-esteem as well, isn't it? You're not, not then saying the sky is blue and it's been a lovely day. You're actually appreciating something in yourself, which has surely got to have an overflow into how confident you feel that day about yourself, I imagine. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it is it is a good way to start because... I. The way that I look at it is um, it just gives you a bit more, um, it gives you a bit more confidence in who who you are because you know where 
if you put everything down, you are self-aware. So it's like digging into your subconscious. And the, I think after you've done the work, you start to realize how far you've come. And if you have these, if you have thoughts, which you know, you wouldn't have came near a couple of years ago. I think that is something to be grateful for. And I think we should celebrate that. So brilliant. I mean, I wanted to wrap up with a question about your advice to other women in their 40s, because I think you're just such a fantastic example of, I think, taking life by the horns and thinking, well, it's not going to fix itself for me. But then you've almost leapfrogged any issues and gone head head first into life, which is a really inspiring story. So what would you advise to other women who might not be feeling their fire in their 40s just yet? Yeah, um, well, it's interesting you say that um, why it feels like that I, I leapfrog issues because I also think that like part of it is not doing that. I think it is the digging in and knowing what the issues are and facing them. And because, um, yeah, I... I'm a firm believer in um, things just aren't going to get better by themselves. Um, if you want things to get better or you want to get in a better place, you've got to work at it. Um, and that often involves digging in and doing the work that you don't want to do. And um, and it's funny because like a lot of people say, you know, you're so strong, you, you know, you'll overcome this. And I'm like, well, yeah, but, I mean, there was a point I felt strong and stupid. <laughs> Like in that um, I was like, oh, I'm, I keep going. I'll be okay. I'll carry on. But like, I think everything catches up to you. Um, so yeah, I think for any advice that I have for women in their forties is um, if you're not at the same place that I feel like I'm at, is um, you've got to figure out who, what you need to do to be your authentic self, and um, what you need to change, and be prepared for the hard conversations and be prepared for things to seem really hard before they get easier. But I think it's just so important once we get to this stage to realise who we are because you don't want that regret later on in life. You don't want to realise that you've been somebody else your whole life and that you're the real you is underneath. Um, so I think, yeah, doing the work is really important. It doesn't matter how old you are. I think it's just it's just something we all need to do if we want to get to the best part of our lives. Thank you. There's some really great tangible pieces of advice there. I think leapfrog is definitely not the right term. Maybe it is something around walking into the fire because you ultimately yes, yeah. had a lot of guts to kind of go, it's only, there's no getting around this, but you've really truly come through that. And yes, you might have the scars to prove it. Uh, <laughs> but I think with your business success and the way in which that's happened, which has been through your love of film and actually just daring to take a big jump means that it's it's been well worth it. I don't think you would have been physically or mentally strong enough to have dared to take that risk otherwise, would you? No, not at all. Like I, yeah, 10 years ago, they, I don't even, yeah. I can't even imagine what, if I hadn't gone through everything that I've been through and I and I think to myself, I, it's it would be so easy to say, I wish my marriage didn't break down and things like that, but I, I wouldn't have done anything near what I've done if it hadn't. I, and I wouldn't wouldn't have done boxing. I wouldn't have done, wouldn't have done pole dancing. I wouldn't have started the business if I hadn't gone through that. So, yeah, like I mean, they say no regrets, but I mean that's what, no, nothing that I've got to regret about there. <laughs> it's it's crazy. I'm thank you so much for sharing. No, your, thank you. We're gonna call it the relaunch because I think honestly, it's a it's a very empowering story to show that. If you put the effort in, it's amazing where you can end up afterwards. So really looking forward to following your journey and everything that you get up to with Priceless Media. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great and I've loved telling my story. Thank you so much, Nikki. Take care. Thanks, Anna.